What's up, y'all? I recently rewatched American History X, one of my favorite films of all time. A Wikipedia the director, so I was like, who's this directed by? I don't remember, and I, I, I found this. I found this to be super interesting. So it was directed by this guy named uh, Tony Kay. And I was like, damn, I've never, I've never heard that name in my life. And just scrolling through his Wikipedia, I stumbled across this section right here, which like blew my mind. Um, essentially, this this director, the who created one of the like arguably one of the greatest films of all time, essentially only ever did like one film. So I started to do a deep dive on, on Tony K and like what happened to him. Why why didn't this guy ever? Put out anything after American History X, and the story is like it's crazy. Essentially, during like the post-production of American History X, he had like a full-on mental breakdown and burnt every possible bridge in Hollywood and completely torpedoed his filmmaking career. And if you can, drop a like or maybe a subscribe, and let's just keep it moving. Let's jump into this tale. My vision of the film never made it to the screen because Edward Norton the actor was permitted by the producers to edit and alter the film. Tony Kay got a start making commercials in the UK in the 70s and 80s. A medium that you could say is kind of low brow for someone who's aspiring to be this like high level Kino level director, but he managed to cement his name, winning all these awards. He's like the most accredited, the most awarded commercial director of all time in the UK. But what ended up happening was Kay ended up getting comfortable in this role of making fairly good money as this commercial director, but not pursuing his dreams to making film. Essentially being a large fish in a small pond. I had only got into advertisements because I knew it was a surefire route into movies. But if you're not careful, you get paid a lot of money to stay where you are in life. I could feel that happening. Years would go by and unhappy with the situation, Kay would finally take a leap of faith moving to Hollywood, Los Angeles to pursue his filmmaking career. When I left London for Los Angeles in 1990, I saw myself following in the footsteps of legends like Von Stroheim, Wells, Coppola. I assumed that to be a good director, you had to be a pirate, just like those guys. What I didn't understand was that they all were playing the game and played it magnificently. Using the relationships he had cultivated in the entertainment industry, he managed to find work fairly quickly, being offered a script for a movie about about a ultra-violent neo and his relationship with his impressionable younger brother. He'd read through the script and instantly start making changes, molding this diamond in the rough into the masterpiece it would become. The film, of course, would go on to be American History X, produced by the studio New Line Cinema, who would insist that he use then-Hollywood golden child Edward Norton in the lead role of Derek, a choice that Kay would openly be against, but as a first-time director, didn't really have the, the power to say no. Despite the suggestion he held an open casting call for the role behind New Line Cinema's back, but was unfortunately unable to find a better candidate. He had this to say about casting Norton. One advantage of having Edward is that we shared a vision on how to improve the script. In casting him, I was really buying another writer. By all accounts, the filming of American History X actually seemed to go pretty smoothly, but it was in post-production that the battle lines were drawn between K and New Line. New Line and Norton had pages and pages of notes about his 96 minute cut of the film that he had handed in. And this is where Kay's mental state really started to deteriorate. He'd get in many heated debates with New Line Cinema, eventually leading to him being barred from editing the film with editing duties being passed off to Edward Norton. Kay was irate with the situation, and after many arguments with the studio, eventually they put him back in the director's chair, allowing him extra time and money for reshoots to then re-edit the film. A year passed by, and New Line Cinema began to worry that there was no end in sight for this new cut of the film. So they made their own cut of the film, which was 40 minute longer than Kay's original version. This would be the final commercial cut of the film. The movie they had put out was crammed with shots of everyone crying in each other's arms. And of course, Norton had generously given himself more screen time. When I realized that this cut was being released, I went into a kind of mania. Kay is now fully in the midst of a mental breakdown. He was done with the film and refused to do any press or go to any festivals to promote it. And for a smaller film like American History X, these promotional tactics are essential. But when I asked for my name to be removed from the picture, which impacts so much on free speech, my own union 
The Directors Guild of America refused to permit me to withdraw my name. New Line asked Kay if they can meet and come to some sort of agreement. Kay would hire a priest, a rabbi, and a Buddhist monk to accompany him to the meeting. This is a real live non sequitur joke. A priest, a rabbi, and a Buddhist monk walk into a movie studio for a meeting. And it's worth mentioning that he didn't know these three people, he just hired them, and didn't really brief them on the situation as to what was going on at all. All he really told them was simply, quote, you don't have to be on my side, but if you want to say something in there, just come out with it. New Line decided to promote the movie without K, getting it to premiere at the Toronto Film Festival. At the time, he was filming a commercial in Germany, and when he found out, he jumped on the first flight to Canada, headed straight to the front office of the Toronto Film Festival, and got the movie pulled from the festival. New Line Cinema was understandably furious with him at the time, and it was at this point that he decided to just cut all communication with them, completely ghost them. He then went on this campaign, which cost him over $100,000, this was in the 90s no less, basically buying full-page ads in publications like Variety and The Hollywood Reporter, and these ads featured cryptic messages directed at New Line Cinema, including quotes from people like Shakespeare and Lennon. Michael DeLuca, then president of New Line Cinema, would purchase his own ad at the time with a cryptic message, which was a quote from Dr. Seuss, essentially making fun of Tony K. And in some weird roundabout way, this would be like a prequel to a Twitter beef. Now proceeding completely without K, New Line Cinema would release American History X in theaters. So he went back to the Directors Guild of America and demanded that he be accredited under a pseudonym under the name Humpty Dumpty. They denied this request as well. With all these failed attempts to get the film pulled or his name removed from it, K's mental state continued to deteriorate. I had a I immersed myself in books about military strategy, and I got into my head that I could arrange attacks on theaters that were showing the movie. One idea that almost came to fruition was to send a posse of demonstrators along to barricade the doors and prevent the audience from getting in. I was on a mission. Despite actively trying to destroy his directorial debut, American History X would release in 1998 to positive critical reception. His directing style would be held in high regards by critics, along with Edward Norton's lead performance garnering him an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. He would try to sue New Line Cinema and the Directors Guild of America for $200 million, but the case would be thrown out in 2000. In 2002, he started working with Marlon Brando, who invited him on set for a project he was doing as an actor. He would show up on the first day in an Osama costume, which had nothing to do with the movie. After immediately being removed from set on the first day and not being welcomed back, he would try and take this Osama bit or whatever he was trying to do onto the New York comedy scene, who were also not receptive, seeing this was 2002. He'd largely never be heard from again. In 2006, he would release a documentary called Lake of Fire, which did garner a lot of critical praise. But with all the bridges he had burned in the entertainment industry, it really didn't get the traction it deserved. Tony Kay would go back to what he did best, filming commercials and music videos. This is the tale of a man who filmed one of the greatest movies of all time and then destroyed destroyed and torpedoed his career in the midst of a psychotic break.